Scholar Tricia Rose studies African American life, culture, and the impact of inequality in the post-civil rights era. She is Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. Her work is especially interested in the important role African American expressive culture plays in creating spaces of recognition, resilience, and resistance. Her books include Longing to Tell, The Hip Hop Wars, and Black Noise, which is considered a foundational text for the academic study of hip hop. In her new book, she reveals how an array of policies and practices connect and interact to produce a devastating meta-racism, far worse than the sum of its parts. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with award-winning journalist and longtime library friend, Tracy Matisak. Please welcome our guest to the Free Library. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for sharing your Wednesday evening with us on this beautiful, warm uh, spring evening. We're delighted to have you with us, and we are especially delighted to have Professor Tricia Rose with us to discuss her new book, Meta Racism. Um, I will tell you, do not be fooled by the size of the book, because there is a lot of well-researched information in here. We will get through as many questions as we can, and as we always do, we have budgeted some time for your questions as well. So uh, if you have a question for Professor Rose, just raise your hand when we get to that point in the program, and uh, we will get a microphone to you, and uh, we'll get through as many questions as we have time to get through. So that said, Professor Rose, welcome to the Philadelphia Free Library. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's really great to be here. I've heard so much about this storied building, but I've never been in it. The building is extraordinary. As I pulled, I'm like, is this the building that's been going on for like three blocks? <laughs> I'm like, I said, anytime you put a library in a building that big, you're saying something. So yes. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> we are proud of it, aren't we? You should be. You should be. <laughs> so let's start by defining our terms. Yeah. Um, what is meta racism? How do you define it? Okay, I'm going to do a little preamble and then I'm going to give you okay. a very clear definition. So um, when we say things like, which we very frequently do, the system is broken, right? We're frustrated, something terrible's happened. We say the system is broken frequently. But in fact, the system is not broken. If you, if you study systems and you learn what systems mean, you will realize from looking at the way racism actually works that it is working in the way that it intends. And I'm not talking about a nefarious conspiracy theory. I'm saying that the way things are organized and arranged produce this outcome over and over, right? It's not a one-off, one little broken wing on the system on the left. Now, the reason I've gone ahead and made uh, that statement is because we are very um, generally not very aware of what makes a system a system, and this term comes from system thinking. So in a system, all the parts are interconnected in various ways. So there are parts you can identify, it's quality one. Num quality two is there are, uh, those parts are interconnected. And number three, those parts are interconnected in such a way that they create effects that are bigger than any individual part. Meta, uber, if you want to, you know, be German. Um, and any number of other uh, uh, words are used to describe that, that third piece of the puzzle, which is, when they're interconnected, they're not just hanging next to each other like, you know, schools and housing. You go to school in the same district as you live. That's a system, but it's not that meta effect of what happens when you drill down and pay attention to what that means because of how we handle property taxes and funding schools and things like that. So meta racism is meant to describe what happens when a system that is designed to produce racial inequality accumulates over time and, the, and what the nature of those effects are, right? And so I want people to really have to, it's sort of one of those titles that says like, well, what do you mean? Is it everywhere? Is meta? Is it can't be escaped? Is this Facebook again? You know, like, wh why, why are we here? You know, I thought of that before meta became a Facebook word. Um, but I wanted everyone to really understand that this is bigger than just a little bit goes on in housing a little bit goes on in education. Oh, there's some bad cops, but otherwise things are generally fine. And yeah, there's a 10 to one wealth gap, but you know, it'll dissipate over time, right? Those kinds of explanations make the seeing of the meta quality, the interconnected compounding nature of systems frames invisible. And I wanna bring those to light. 
It seems like around the time that George Floyd was murdered, we mm. started hearing terms like systemic racism, structural racism. Mm -hmm. They became part of our lexicon. You make a distinction, though, between those two. What yes, is that yes, distinction? I do. And I'm happy to say that I was as confused as the next person for a long time. I used them interchangeably. So I don't want anyone to think I was born knowing this distinction. I was All of a sudden, I realized, oh, there's a massive distinction no one or few people are concerned with. So structure, to say something is structural, is to say that it is built in to the condition and circumstances you're in. So you can have something built in to, a, to an institution. It could be built into um, uh, a, a, a local organization as opposed to, say, an entire set of uh, outfits for an institution. And it's built in. How it's built in is not clear, necessarily. It, you don't necessarily know where, why, and how and nor is there any requirement that the way that it's built in is interconnected. So you can have a structure that has racial, negative racial effects, but it doesn't have to overlap with something else. When you call something a system, you are by definition describing something that has identifiable parts that are um, interconnected to one another and that dynamic interconnection produces effects that are greater than the sum of any of those parts. So it's dynamic and compounding, and it is maintained over time. Systems do not pop up today and close out tomorrow. They take some time, and then they also evolve, and there's all kinds of other interesting things about them. But that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It has profound consequences for how we respond to the problem of racism. Structural racism, you could disband an organization. Say there's just a company that is doing terrible things on its own, right? You could, it's built into their culture. It's built into their you know, HR practices, whatever. You say, okay, well, let's just take their license away or let's clear out all of the management. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with a, a system that will change very little. So the difference is not just a semantic or some annoying academic one, which it may be feeling like right now, but it is in fact extremely consequential for understanding what any group of people who are subjected to a systemic form of discrimination are facing, mm -hmm. and it dramatically changes the way we might be thinking about productive solutions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned three factors that are involved in meta-racism, um, containment, extraction, and punishment of black people. And a little bit later on, I want to talk about some specific examples of how that mm -hmm. plays out. But just to begin with, could you give a sort of a higher level view of what each yeah. of those things is? Yeah, so um, I, I read into and examined about 80 to 100 policies across five areas in society. The fifth, which is health, is not in the book, but we can talk about that later. So going through all of them, you know, I would look and I'd say, okay, well, this doesn't on its face have anything discriminatory in its language, because all post-civil rights era policies, which is what I focused on, they don't have that Jim Crow moment, right? Of none of this, none of that, you have to stay here, here's the law, blah, blah, blah. It's more like, no, everybody's equal on paper, and then the whole process is gonna continue with no actual acknowledgement. So, um, as I was looking, I started thinking these policies are so different from one another and they intersect in such interesting ways. And I thought after, I mean, it had to have been close to two years, I thought, you know, they seem to have the same very similar qualities of outcomes. So they might say it's for one thing, but then it also, it say it's a punishment, say it's uh, you've gone to jail for something. But then they have rules about when you get out that not only just continue the punishment, but they work to contain you or extract resources. And so then I'm like, well, wait a minute. And I, once I came up with those three, and I had paid attention to some of them individually in the literature, many people write about them, but not all three of them together, so interlockingly for so long. And that's when I realized, oh, the policy is a means to an end. You always want to contain black people. There's not a moment in US history mm -hmm. that containment has not been a driving force. How we contain has shifted, right? Gentrification is containment, away from opportunity. Mm. It's not containment in the same neighborhood as redlining produced. Um, you know, extraction is about money, it's about confidence, it's about uh, in, you know, intelligence. I mean, you look at the school system and the quality and the access and the resources that mm. is so disparate, you can't possibly be expecting that person to come out with, with their natural sense of self intact, mm. right? Um, and so it's not just extraction means money, Containment doesn't only mean physical, 
right? And punishment does not only mean prison. But when you look at those three things together, whoo, I mean, it's, it's actually, that was the most difficult part of the book for me to come to terms with. Yeah. That and then Mike Brown's story was just was a little. It was a lot. The real story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you see it as you read some of the examples that mm -hmm. you cite, then you can start identifying those three factors mm -hmm. in so many of these stories. You also yeah. write about how all too often society tends to think of racism as individual acts of racism, interpersonal mm -hmm. acts, not unlike what you experienced when you were in ninth grade and you write about this in the book and you went to visit a friend yeah. who, a classmate who lived on the Upper East Side mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Um, and, and we'll get to why it's so much bigger than individual acts, but I still think that your story yeah. is worth telling. If you would yeah, share sure. with us sure. what happened yeah, um, in sure. that experience. So I'm from New York City, and uh, I grew up first in Harlem in the 1960s, and then we moved out to Co-op City in the Bronx, which I only learned recently was like a communist cooperative. I'm like, wow, I was way cool before I knew <laughs> I was cool. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? I was like, I was in a communist cooperative. Don't mess with me. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I didn't know that, but my parents, you know, were dead set on me going to schools that would match what they felt was my capacity. So I finally got into Dalton, a very elite east side private high school. I commuted an hour and a half each way, three hours a day for six years alone on the train from 12 to 17. Mm. I mean, you know, like that's a long time to be on the train alone at 12. Um, anyway, so... Um, one time I went after school to visit, you know, somebody in my class. And, you know, Upper East Side real estate is, is a no joke. It wasn't just middle class. It's like stratospheric. And so I go to the, to say I'm going here to visit Carrie. And he said, well, to go around the back and use the service elevator. And it, I didn't even really understand what he was saying to me. So I went around the back. And, you know, I'm in the elevator. Like, why am I in the service elevator? I said I was her friend at Dalton. And it, then it took a minute. And at first I thought, and most of my life I thought, you know, this is just a person who needs education. You know, and I was like, we have to educate, you know, and I was all peppy and, and hopeful about that notion of education because I just thought it was so ridiculous that as soon as you knew it, you'd be fine. You'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, Trisha Rose, you know. I just didn't know. Really appreciate that information. But then you realize later in life it's much more productive than it is an absence of information. It's like what work does it do? Like, for mm -hmm. example, here we are. I'm obviously much older, and I know the story. Why? Why do I know the story? Yeah. Because he was, he was understanding me in a way that was implicitly, uh, you know, class-based, yeah. which I don't even have a problem with if it was an appreciation for me because of that, but it was a devaluing of me and an assumption about me that I did not belong there as a friend, yeah. right? And, you know, this is like the mid-1970s. This is not like 1936, you know, you know somewhere else. So... Yeah. And there, I have a hundred stories like that, but the main issue was the, the particular way that, that you, I'm being positioned is, hey, you're here, but you don't belong here, yeah. right? And that could be, you know, and, and that was a form, a time, that's not a form of containment because it wasn't a systemic practice. It was an individual practice that fuels the ideas that keep systemic racism functional, but it is not itself yeah. systemic racism. Well, Do you understand what I mean by that? Because we don't want to collapse everything into, you call someone a bad word and it's systemic racism. It's like, no, right. it's actually not. Right. And, and, and speaking of individual acts, um, around the time, again, of George Floyd, there was this proliferation of books, as you mentioned, about you know, how not to be a racist and how to be an ally. And, mm -hmm. and those books were very um, popular. People mm -hmm. were very interested in them. Um, but they did not talk about the larger systemic structure mm -hmm. that you're writing about here. Do yeah. those books, though, still have their place? Well, you know, I'm never going to argue there should be no certain books that don't exist because, you know, I'm a, I'm a thinker, so, you know, you just, even if you want to kick it across the room, which has happened, um, <laughs> you know, you just still think books should exist. And I also would want to remind people that the level of banning and censorship that's going on, we want to be very careful not to get in that bandwagon when we think it benefits us. What we need is critical thinkers who know what to do with material because it's always going to come at us. Those books have a place for sure, right? I mean, yeah. you know, Ibrahim Kendi is, it, and, mm -hmm. and you know, Robin D'Angelo and others are trying to address the consciousness of whiteness, at least in her case, and in his case, the kind of built-in language of race that has historically shaped the society. And then there's this notion of like, I'm going to tell you how to be an anti-racist. That's where I got a little 
I, I was like, well, that's really not going to happen in this book, bruh. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. And it also panders to a comfort zone. Mm. You know, one of the things that keeps us doing the same thing over and over and over again in this country is because people who we need to be allies with do not want to be uncomfortable, mm. right? And every time you push it forward past their comfort zone, which is, you know, I don't know about like this <laughs> you know, voice to mic, you end up with silence, uh, retreat, reframing, accusations, and then eventually, you know, just disengagement. Right. So for me, it's about how do we tell it in a way, tell the, the truth in a way that makes it, we're accountable, but we're not accused. And we're responsible for what we know now. Right. Um, and, and we can see how it can go on, even if we have fantastic liberal or left values. Yeah. Because you know one of the things that keeps people from thinking that there's no system is they're like, well, I'm not a racist. I fought in the civil rights movement. My kids are not a racist. They're part of Black Lives Matter, or you know maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, and my neighborhood is liberal, and the country fil fixed the laws. So, so not, what are you talking about, Trisha? Yeah. Right? And so, yeah. my book is an answer to that. I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. you can have all the values in the world. That doesn't mean the country is functioning in your name, yeah. but it is providing you with the investments and the advantages that you would have had even before all of those changes. That's what people don't want to believe. They want to think they're here only because of hard work. Right, and it's just not how it works. Hmm. I mean, I, I you know, it's like I don't, I don't. As a, I mean, I don't like to make people uncomfortable, but I think we have to be honest that it's going to make us uncomfortable. Yeah. How are we going to fix this problem and be all happy, go lucky all the way through? Yeah. Well, speaking of discomfort and <laughs> book bans, um, <laughs> you, as a professor of Africana studies, know more than anyone about the recent backlash about yeah. African American AP studies. Um, so now. You know, there's not just a resistance to fighting racism, but even to talking about it, thinking about it, learning about it now, right. um, because it has created a sense of discomfort. Um, you know, you, words like woke and CRT have become kind of dirty Pirates, words yeah. um, mm -hmm. in certain places. And so, um, because of the discomfort that they've created, and I wonder if you would speak to that, uh, particularly as a professor of Africana yeah. studies. <laughs> That's true. You would think we'd be talking about that all day. You know, go figure. Um, I guess we don't think it's hysterical enough. You know, academics are complicated because we have so much responsibility in one direction that it's hard to just pivot out. And this is a huge pivot out. Some of us are very big in activism. Some of us aren't. Um, so I'm, I wish we were doing a little bit more. That was a long-winded way of saying that. But let me let me speak to this discomfort and, and also to this notion of the, the uh, as you said, becoming sort of dirty words. I think that's a great description. Um, there's never been a moment, there's <laughs> never been a moment, I'm gonna stay back here. <laughs> there's never been a moment in, in African American and American history where the language of black resistance or the language of black uh, challenge to domination uh, was not reappropriated for the purposes of delegitimation and devaluation. Never, it's always been a multi-pronged strategy, outright violence, legal changes, ideological warfare of different types, and then the language of freedom or the language of, of justice, the language of equality gets changed. So colorblindness, mm -hmm. instead of being a strategy to address already existing racial categories to say, we want to shoot for a colorblind future, but we're not gonna be there until we account for color appropriately, and it's reality, gets used to say, oh no, we're ready now. Why are we ready now? The laws say you can't discriminate. It's not our fault they're not being practiced properly, or that you know, from Re Reagan on, uh, we just gutted all the, all the enforcement staff and enforcement mm -hmm. units. So what's happening is, it's not just that people are afraid of these words, but they are being, they are being ma manipulated into being afraid. And they're also being embarrassed. It's almost like, you remember when hip hop started, and if you were white and into hip hop, they had like really bad names for you, which I'll leave alone here. I'll let the, the podcast people you know, Google when they're home. Um, but you know, they had names for them, but it was meant to embarrass them for being associated mm -hmm. with blackness, for being associated with, with the struggle. So there's a way of shaming whites who were involved in Black Lives Matter and who have been part of this struggle for decades and generations across different groups. Mm -hmm. So what what's happening is it's not, 
So, th so there's this silencing because once you talk openly and honestly about this, it's really no way out. You, you, can't, you just can't be open and honest about what's happened and then say, oh, well, everything is good. So they have to burn it to the ground. Mm -hmm. right? So their whole thing is, you say anything and it makes my kid feel bad. And their own kids are saying, I don't feel bad. <laughs> They're like, I don't, I don't feel bad. They, yeah. they, they want to know, right? And so, of course, they're freaked out by this. We're taking over the academy. Please come to Brown anytime and just see how much we're taking over the entire university. <laughs> um, I mean, it's so absurd. Yeah. But they have to create this fear that it's African Americans and the category of race in particular that is destroying a meritocracy, mm -hmm. that is destroying equal access. Now, let me remind you, we've had athletic reasons for taking people for hundreds of years. We've had legacy reasons. I didn't see them banning gender as a category in DEI admissions. So if you have a STEM program that has not enough women, which I still think is really important to do, so I'm not, I'm against it, but I'm saying, why didn't it come up? The Civil Rights Act had that in gender and sexuality. It was in the same act. You see my yeah. point? So there's the stigma and this reversal that these are unworthy people who have no reason to be attended to because there's no racial context of discrimination happening. Mm -hmm. So they're, ch they're changing that language and attempting to tr make it so that you know, white kids who might have been interested, brown kids, immigrants of different backgrounds who might have been interested yeah. in learning these things will now think twice because they don't want to look embarrassed. They don't want to be you know, teased by other kids. I mean, literally, that's where we're at now. Mm. And and they also then will never know the things that we have moved forward knowledge-wise, right? They just won't know. Yeah. That's a really important problem, very, because what they're doing is cultivating a racist form of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Whiteness, like any other racial category that we've invented, because none of this exists in biology or nature, is a category we can revive, mm -hmm. right? Blackness mm -hmm. has changed dramatically from 1865 to the present. Yeah and not as much in some ways as we'd like materially, but in terms of who black people are and how they think of themselves, speaking here from the US perspective. Massive change. Why can't that be true for everybody else? But they don't want, some people in the society don't want that because they know working class whites will stop fighting mm -hmm. <laughs> black and brown people, immigrants, Muslims, Mexican Americans, or Mexicans before they become Mexican Americans, and they'll start fighting the people who've taken their jobs, which is not these poor mm. people, right? The people who've destroyed their towns, the people who've created very limited opportunities for local business, right? So th it is a very intentional strategy that is familiar. Yes. Let me just say one more thing, because I think strategy is so interesting. I don't know if you remember the Southern strategy that, um, um, uh, God, I, I knew his name was gonna, uh, don't say it. <laughs> oh, all right, say it, say it, say it. Not Strom Thurmond, Lee Atwater. Yeah, yes. Lee Atwater. He yes. was, you know, that, that yes. audio tape of him saying this wasn't released until the gentleman who took the audio tape passed away because they didn't want to have a controversy. But he explicitly says on tape that what they did after the civil rights movement was move away from explicit language where you could literally say N word, N word, N word, N word, which he did. He said, and then you have to start moving into more indirect language like states' rights and freedom mm -hmm. and some other term I don't recall right now. He said, and then eventually it's so abstract, you don't realize you're talking about race at all. He said, but you notice, you will notice that it always has a disproportionate effect on black people. Yeah. I was like, man, that brother was describing meta-racism. Yeah. I was like, I guess it's more organized than I thought, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it was really true because that's exactly what we have. Yeah. So it, was a tr it took 50 years, but here we are. Yeah. Well, in talking about education, one of the stories that really stood out to mm. me as I read your book, and, and you, you know, you certainly you cover Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, the worst examples of racism leading to the deaths of these young men and so many others, but you also write about Kelly Williams Bolar, um, who was convicted of stealing education for her daughters in 2011, I think it was. Can mm -hmm. you remind us, because her story, while it made headlines, um, I don't know that everybody remembers her story the way that yeah. we remember Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and right. George Floyd. Um, right. Can you remind us of her story and kind of what got missed in yeah. the outcry around mm -hmm. her story? Yeah, her story's a little different, partly for, for the reasons you said. People, it didn't make the news for the length of time because it wasn't, she didn't die, right? So that's important. She wasn't 
uh, there was no sort of, uh, you know, um, video or testimony of people watching a body laying in the street, you know, for four hours in the hot sun. I mean, these things are very traumatic. So they take a different space, and maybe they should for that reason. But what I thought was amazing about her story, and this was like, it's a little bit like investigative sleuthing, like a little bit of, you know, digging in the archives slash investigative journalism, you know, and it's really fun to me to find out like, well, wait, that's really interesting. Well, how does that relate to this? And then this whole picture emerges. And in her case, the surface was the prosecution said, you are stealing education, you are uh, falsifying forms to say that you live in um, uh, the county right outside of West Akron, which was an all-white county. And this county, um, God, my memory, is getting, I'll have to look at the book, but it's, um, it'll come to me, it, it's, I can yeah. see it. Anyway. But it was like the Copley? Yeah, is Copley the Township. Copley? Yeah. Oh, thank you, darling. Copley, <laughs> I'll just think Boston, <laughs> Copley, okay. Um, so she, her father, however, lived in Copley Township, owned a home, did not rent, owned a home. Copley Township was in the 90th percentile white, East, West Akron was 84 to 86% black and then 10, 12% other non uh, people of color, maybe three, 2% white. And those schools were much lower in quality than the ones in Copley Township. It was a classic story. And, they, and she said she was afraid for her neighborhood. After school, there had been a burglar who broke into the homes in her building and I think even her apartment when her daughters were not home. And it freaked her out so much that she moved, she had them enroll in the, in the grandfather's district where they knew he'd be home after school because he had a health condition so he wasn't moving around a lot. He could be there when they got in, they'd be safer. Okay, so all that seems like a kind of reasonable intergenerational family decision, right? I mean, wouldn't you, if, you're, if your father or mother owned a home in a town that had schools that were one, you know, highly ranked in the top 10%, wouldn't you put your kids over there? I mean, who wouldn't do that? <laughs> and now, we're talking like two miles. Right, less than two miles, yeah. right. So she was within two miles of that school and further away was the school that she was supposed to send her kids to. Now here's what's amazing about this and this is why I enjoyed the sleuthing most specifically. The stealing of the education, right, was a part of a an attempt to criminalize the educational system in the way so many other institutions had been criminalized by actually criminalizing the parents or people of color in the process. So when I did some homework, I realized that the Ohio um, Supreme Court had already outlawed district-specific education and said it's unconstitutional because of the inequities. So everyone in the state was said, you can send your kids to any district you want. It's a cool thing, right? If you want to drive five hours a day to drop your kids off, sleep in the car, wait for them to come out at three, drive them home and get like world-class education, that you're right. But guess what happened? The wealthiest district, it's the most homogeneously white and powerful, said, oh no, 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 no. We want an opt-out program. And they have pressure, they have so much leverage. And they said, we don't want any of the state allocation because states get, towns get a foundation amount and then their taxes make up the difference, roughly. It's a super truncated conversation. So Copley Township was an opt-out district. So from their vantage point, it was just preserving our resources. We have a right to teach our kids what we want, you know, with our money. Right? It was a very privatized concept of public education. So she's in a state not where this is really against the law. She's doing what the Supreme Court mandated. But this power and leverage that certain people were able to execute meant that the opt-out was not was now given the opportunity yeah. to, to stigmatize her ability to bring her daughters to the school right just two miles away. Now there's been a ton of research about this practice where a very badly uh, performing school with low resources and poor people of color and immigrants is right up against a district which has all the opposite characteristics. And they basically said this is an arbitrary moment right here. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, there's no reason this, this line is drawn for the purposes of creating this hoarding access to education. So I thought that was very interesting because by the time we get to a case like Michael Brown's Normandy High School, mm -hmm. it's, it's already been in this network of jostling and management of power um, that creates this inequity. The other thing was the fact that she was a mom and the way they executed the devaluing of black women as part of the shaming of the process. That she was a criminal, not a good mom, right? She was, she tried to defraud the state. 
you know, that was her purpose. And you know, what was wonderful was that a lot of people of different backgrounds were like, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> My kids go to another district, you know, and they would wait till their kids were out, of course. Um, you know, and I went there, and people like, you know, famous black people said, well, I went, my mom did that, and what else could we do? So there was a lot of support, but there was also that vicious, vicious attacks on yeah. her, you know, as a way of demonizing. So I thought it was a helpful way to show how space and, and containment, again, in neighborhoods, and also this was a process by which the rule says one thing, but here's the workaround. The workaround is race neutral. But who can afford to work around? What towns can pay for their foundation? They're writing a check. They have so many resources. They're writing a check to say, no, we don't want any state money for school. We're, we're good. And she did, she was sent to jail. She was sent to that. jail. And then, you know, the governor pardoned her. But what they wanted, this is the other sickness about, a lot about, I think, the criminal justice system, is that they wanted her to be humiliated and to be, to show a level of shame and embarrassment. And she was too cocky. She was too like, look, I want my kids to have a good education. And they were saying, well, were you, why did you have to do crime to do that? She's like, well, look at the school. And then it would be this back and forth. You're either trying to help your kids for ec educational reasons or you're afraid of crime. And I'm saying, oh no, those things are connected. A systems yeah. analysis will show you they generate each other's yeah. relationship. You see, so this whole non-systems approach can make you think it's a single access problem. A great school in a very dangerous, stressed out, chronically uh, you know, um, vulnerable community is not gonna stay a very good school for long if it's, if it's populated by people in the neighborhood because the, the families are trauma-based, really. Yeah. You see, so that's the kind of thing when we put it together and we imagine, hey, we're talking about our kids, then all of a sudden it's crystal clear. Crystal clear. So that's why I thought Kelly was an important case for the yeah. gender reasons the way women and moms, black women and moms were demonized, the way the machinations behind the scenes that brought that to that moment. Yeah. You see, when we tell the story about she's a, she's a criminal, right? That's the same as, you know, he's a racist, right? Darren Wilson is a racist, the mm. cop mm -hmm. in, in uh, um, Fer Ferguson. But when we're looking at someone to say, well, she's a criminal, that's the same single access thinking. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Yes, okay, she did defraud. The rules were built that way. That's true. So did Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement, right? So it's about getting people to see that is this whole structure and system around it that yeah. tells us quite a bit that if we don't attend to it, we have nothing but the other way of thinking, which is Kelly is a fraud, you know, a federal, she's, a, she's a fraudster. She's trying to yeah. defraud the government. She doesn't care about her daughter's education. Yeah. Um, Trisha, I'd like you to take an example of, there, there are several people that you write about in the book, but to kind of show us how these systems interconnect, and, and we've seen pieces of it throughout the conversation, but maybe there's one example, I don't know if it's Michael Brown or who it mm -hmm. might be, yeah. where you can sort of weave for us how one system or one policy affects another, and you sort of get this overriding yeah. meta-racism. That's it's really, yeah. I mean, and I will say, I just, let me just say two couple, two things before that. These are, first of all, these are really amazing questions. Can I take you home with me and like <laughs> bring you with me to the next to city? I'm not sure what it is, but I'll pay your whole way and back. It's on podcast. It's going to be recorded live here. So anyway, I know you're busy. Well, whatever. But if you if you're into it, let me know. Um, um, so um, I had to decide. You know, when I figured out how systems work, which took its own toll on me as a non-science person, it's really a STEM. Phenomenon. You have to, you know, if you really dig into it, it's out. It's outside of my technical realm, but it has a, a framework that you can understand. Then I had to figure out how to describe the practices, and then I had to figure out how do I tell the story. Mm -hmm. This is very hard to figure out because it flies in the face of all the things you would normally do for a public book for the public or even an academic book, because you couldn't just list all the policies and say, you know, here they are. You have to show them in action, in relationship. But then you have to figure out, well, what stories do people already know? Hmm. Because if I had to tell the story and they had never heard it before, then it wouldn't compel them to believe that the version I'm telling is different than the one they already think they know, right? So then I had to decide, I had to really cross my fingers and say, is it better to tell a story that's a little bit older because that's what more people know, what they think they know is kind of embedded, or should I go with a, you know, an immediate one? And mm -hmm. George Floyd happened near the writing process mm -hmm. or during it. 
And I decided that you know it takes a lot of research to get that much information about all the schools that say Trayvon went to in his district, the one mm. in Stanford, and the class, you know, how the how the foreclosure crisis in 2008 impacted George Zimmerman, and so on and so. Mm. So this takes. It's not like it's just hey, let me just tell you about one school. Right. So I decided to pick these three for a variety of reasons, but especially that they were very visceral to the national imagination, mm -hmm. especially the two, Trayvon and, and Mike Brown. Mike Brown, many people say, was the real catalyst for Black Lives Matter, and the whole thing, the beginning of this outrage was Trayvon as a point of accumulation, really. So um, that I just wanted to explain that because people will say, well, why did you pick those? And I'm sure if I, if I write another edition, yeah, I'll probably do the homework on George Floyd. Mm. That will not, I've already done enough to say, okay, well, there's a chapter, check. It's not, you know, maybe I'll have yeah. people write it with me because I think it'd be really interesting to take these tools to a community of people and say, how does this work for you? Maybe just go to Minneapolis. So I'm thinking of creative ways to deploy the process. But let's take Mike Brown. Does everyone mm -hmm. feel like they know what happened in Ferguson? Mm. Pretty much, I'm like, yeah, they're like, please don't make me raise my hand. Um, um, so um, so in, in the case of Mike Brown, there were, um, when the, oh, no, you notice, well, you don't notice because you haven't necessarily read the book, but I do not talk about the riots or the insurrection because what I'm really interested in is what is the context that leads up to this incident that itself is being understood as the moment of, of racism? And I want to unpack the, the, the width and the depth and the interconnected in just ensnarement that is present long before he runs into Darren Wilson or Wilson runs into him. And that, it's that setup that's really important. The same thing's true for Trayvon. Um, maybe I'll tell Trayvon. Let me go to Trayvon because the title is much more memorable and this is an oral environment. So if you remember the chapter's called No Chance Encounter. And um, the reason I took that title for the Trayvon chapter was because there was a huge People magazine cover a few weeks after he was uh, murdered that said, a chance encounter, right, goes from, you know, life and going to get Skittles to, you know, being... So I started thinking, like, you know, that's such a classic misunderstanding of what happened. It's as if you're saying that the only reason Trayvon was murdered that night was because he just happened to run into one crazy guy. So then I said, okay, well, let's prove it. Let's see what happened. So I said, okay, well, let me really look into what happened at, at school. Why was he suspended? So then I, of course, did a, you know, a whole ton of homework on suspensions in general, but, but I looked specifically to begin with at what happened to Trayvon. So um, he went to a public school that was you know, in a segregated black neighborhood in Florida because that's what things are. And, and um, you know, everyone said he's a bad kid. Remember that everyone was pissed at him for being, you know, having alcohol and all kind of stuff in his, in his social media profile. So and people said, well, he's a bad kid. He got suspended. So the handbook, in, the handbook at, at um, Michael Kropp High School has a set of rules for what you get punished for and what level of punishment. So what they did was, the, the, the end of this piece is that the practices that the school deployed was the same process of overcriminalization that you see in the juvenile justice system, where you create contexts of extreme punishment, some cases punishment when none should apply, other cases where you have an option between, say, one to 10 at a level of infraction, and then what happens is you get 10, and then you get another 10, and then you're out. So it's like this escalation and a hypercriminalization. So what happened to Trayvon? The first time he was in touch with the, you know, the, the, arm, the long arm of the law was he was tardy. And under the crop punishment guidelines, it's not listed, it has no punishment. What did they do? Anybody want to guess? They suspended him. Yeah. So there you have your first moment is like way over the top. It's literally not in the handbook. Second infraction, writing WTF, on a locker once. Level two was the, uh, the uh, punishment, and it was supposed to be a suspension only if serious or habitual. I don't know, that doesn't seem either one of those. We know it's not habitual, he did it once, we have evidence for that, but it doesn't seem like it's worth a suspension, especially now it's on top of a completely fake suspension. Third one is 
the offense was possessing a plastic bag with marijuana residue. It had no marijuana in it, but I guess they tested it and had residue. So he's just no weed in the school. He's just trying to be you know, an ecologically sound recycling person. All right, he's bringing his plastic bags that are empty, you know, Lord knows where. Level three, suspension between one and 10 days. How many days did they give him? 10. That's the infraction that brought him to his father's house. Now, there are a couple things that are really important about this. Number one, he was over-policed, over-suspended in a school that, um, you know, uses this framework to imagine that bad kids are bad, good kids are good, we keep the good ones in, we throw the bad ones away, which makes no sense because then they're outside, pissed and alienated, they grow up, and then we have a crime problem, and you want to know why, right? There's that. But then I looked into it and said, okay, what happens to kids who get suspended a lot? And the research shows that kids who are invested in school, who actually like to be in school, generally speaking, are the ones that are the most negatively impacted by suspension. So you're not teaching the thugs a lesson, which is the, me the metaphor, right? You're teaching the kids who are really interested in school, or somewhat interested in school, that they're unwanted. So you push them actually out when they were kind of in. They weren't just out, out kids. Uh, now, what they did in this case in particular was um, um, take a kid who was interested and then add a level of trauma that is so significant, the suspension process is so painful for kids, even though they bluster, that the American Pediatric Association has a national guideline that all doctors who are pediatricians are required to ask the parents or guardians who bring them in, did your child get suspended any time ever? Because there's so many triggers for alienation, lack of belonging, lack of being appreciated, and uh, that is so significant across every possible group. Mm -hmm. So here we are meeting out excessive punishment over what feels like a crock of nothing. I mean, I went to high school in the 70s. I would definitely not be sitting here. They would have suspended me once a week. I mean, we were doing dumb stuff. You know, let's, maybe I shouldn't have said that on record, but do you know what I mean? Like, you realize this is just like a very, um, it's just suffocating, right? There's no interaction, there's no discussion. Okay, so that's the school thing. Now, back in his home district, uh, very quickly, um, the logic was that Zimmerman was, was, was racially profiling him because Zimmerman was an individual mm -hmm. who had racist problems. He did seem to have them, his little, no, his little notes to the, to the, um, the town, the town uh, you know, self-protection agency. You know, he'd say th crazy things in there. Looks like a black man. Enough that the black men who lived in the compound were like, yeah, I'm staying home. <laughs> I'm just gonna come out in the day because I don't really need to be you know, shot by a man I know who doesn't recognize me at night. Um, so I, I said, okay, there's all of this fear in Zimmerman, but what's the stop and frisk culture in the context of, of Trayvon's life? In his hometown where his mom lived, the, the stop and frisk practice was so extreme that the police themselves called it stop and frisk on steroids. Hmm. They arrested some people 250 times. There was a corner in the, in the poor part of the town where it was a, a package shop and the immigrant family that owned it originally got cameras to stop crime by the, by the people who were buying or not buying the alcohol. The police were so abusive, they turned the cameras and put them outside where the police were behaving to document their discrimination. Mm. And that's how some investigative journalists broke the story about what was going on in his town. So now here I'm saying you have a situation where if he'd stayed home and never gone to Sanford, True, his encounter would be very different. It, maybe he would have lived a long time. Would he have evaded systemic racism? Would his school have treated him better? Would he be frisked and stopped and harassed and maybe, you know, assaulted? Um, you, you see what I'm getting at. So this one chance encounter gives us this whole fiction that, you know, if Zimmerman just happened to feel sick that day and just went inside, all would be good. And what I'm saying rather soberingly, but you know, not, not without hope, that that is not true and that is not where the main problem is. As obvious and horrible as these incidences were, it's the living thousands of Trayvons that I want to change their destiny. And speaking of that, you know, as we listen to, you know, the stories that you shared with us and the research that you've done, it can feel so daunting because of the way that these policies and procedures and systems are interconnected that for any one person it, it would feel like, well, how do you address it? But you do offer right. some thoughts 
around ways that people who find this deeply concerning can take some action. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's, it's a bit of, I, you know, I can't wait to hear what you all think about this problem, this issue in general, but, you know, this is a hard problem to solve, right? But I don't believe, and this is kind of a two, two school, you know, debate. You know, I'm of the school that says, look, if I'm experiencing something, I'd really like to know what it is. Like, I don't want to be coughing all the time, and then somebody, when I die, says, you know, she was living in a highly polluted area, but we knew, but we didn't tell her. <laughs> we thought it would depress her. It would make her not feel like she could really make it in the world. I'm like, well, I'm definitely not going to make it if I don't know what's actually going on right in front of me. So how do we tell that story in a way that's empowering? How do we give young people and their parents and families and communities and allies a sense that this is empowerment, not depression and, you know, and, and, and sort of crushing information. So for me, systems are the way, are the, are the problem and they're the solution. Thank goodness for that. Um, so if you have a system, so you know, I'm saying systemic racism, housing discrimination reduces uh, equity, significantly reduces equity and value, that coupled with segregation and funding schools with property taxes, which very few countries in the world do, um, means that you're compounding, right? That's that intersection, boom, and you're making it bigger and stronger. So now, over time, that thing gets bigger and bigger, right? So what if we did something in the reverse? What if we looked at all of these super muscular leverage points, right, that are these inner connections, and we said, let's take one of these and imagine that the goal is justice. How would you, what would you do, and then how would you replicate it is consistently for long enough that it would have the a justice effect, a fairness effect, right? Now, there's a million problems with doing this simply. This would be very complex, so I'm not being naive. But rather than saying things like, we're gonna fund the schools, or we're gonna make them all take tests and give the, more money to the schools that test well. I mean, it's such a denial of what's happening, it makes things worse. And every year they get worse, and then every year we say, it's black people. They don't like school, they don't have good families, and then we just step over this massive, you know, cavernous hole that people get sucked into. So for me, what systems does is it allows me to think practically in a grounded way to really look at policy and behavior and attitudes, which is where you write, you know, where we started, and to start thinking locally as well as nationally. Because what every chapter case study does is it says, Here's the situation for Trayvon. Here's the situation in Sanford. Here's the situation in Miami uh, Gardens. Here's the situation around the country. That's my way of saying this is not just Florida. This is not just George Zimmerman. But it is Trayvon. It is George Zimmerman. And it is Florida. And it's also nationally. So by doing that, you get this sense of, oh, OK, we can tackle this locally, but we'll do a much better job if we know the national landscape. So my hope for the, the role of systems thinking is that we'll be able to identify leverage points that are now being used for negative impact, and we can focus on those to turn it around. And there are many possibilities there, because even uh, one intersection has multiple mini ones. So the ones that produce economic inequity, there's a million of them, right? So you could, you know, it depends on where you are, what your concerns are, you can tailor it. The other thing that I love about this is that it's also asking people to develop a new way of thinking. And that is, you know, shifting from a one at a time racist, is it racist, finding a racist, is, what do I call it, like whack-a-mole, it's like whack a racist, you know? They pop up in a thing, you're like, bam! You know, it's like, we won! And then you find another. It's like, you know, it might be entertaining, but it's not gonna win. But, so rather than a whack-a-mole paradigm, which is we find these individuals who are destroying our successful racial equity life, you say to yourself, okay, in the course of history, this is not that long for us to get very far. We've been resisting it a long time. How do we really acknowledge that, build camaraderie, but tell the story in a way that tells the truth, but doesn't get into some massively accusatory waste of energy, which is the way I see that. And then you say, OK, how do I tell the story? And then you invite people to have this paradigm shift, which is basically uh, taking all the information you have and choosing a story that goes with that information. Changing your paradigm is looking at all the same information and choosing a different story. So people see all this information and they say it's black culture. <laughs> Darren Wilson went on a tear. I started out at the bottom, I just like you know he did, and 
and so the, the journalist is like, well, is that really true? Yeah, I, and then I work my way up. And I'm like, oh, well, there's 175 articles that show that you and Mike Brown would not have the same experience going in for the same job with the same level of knowledge. It's not gonna happen. So what you're telling me is fiction. So that getting the paradigm that we are, I'm asking you to think about and asking everyone to consider is to account for those documented differences so that we can be honest about them and not get caught up in you know just um, imagining that fixing it one at a time and not addressing these issues is going to make it. So for me, that's very inspiring. But you know, I'm a little weird, so I, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you said, well, it wasn't inspiring for me. But I do, I do think it's, it's, it's important. Last point is that we, you know, we love a Hollywood ending, and we have really, I think, um, what's the word when you um, weaken a muscle? We've, you know, we've. Atrophy, perfect mm. word, thank you, sir. Atrophy, this muscle of managing discomfort, dealing with really difficult conflict, um, keeping sense of people's humanity, and disagreeing. Yeah. I mean, you can go on the web and watch James Baldwin arguing with um, a William, um, fat dude. And you know, you can have that conversation, and it'd be amazing and really interesting and totally opposite. You can have that conversation today. So that muscle has atrophied to such mm. a degree that we're unable to solve the problems we're creating and we want to run away. And saying I want a happy ending is running away. Yeah. Now, you can be hopeful and engaged and connected and know it's going to be a long time. Yeah. You know, nobody in, who was enslaved said, well, you know, if we don't get this done tomorrow, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to try. You, the, what is the alternative? So that, to me, is what inspires me. It gives us tools. And, yeah. and I think there are tools. Let's try to use them. Yeah. Well, on that note, let's take your questions for Professor Rose. She's given us a lot to think about. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I get so excited. I'm like, OK, I'm only going to meet you once. Here's the whole deal. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, it was, I'm going to get the book. so. Um, but I wanted to uh, guess your thoughts on uh, I don't know if you know Charles Blow mm -hmm. and uh, from New York Times, and he yeah. wrote a book just recently about um, reverse uh, migration, migration, and um, that could solve some of the problems in, in the South, and it's because it's you know most populous area of mm -hmm. black people, and we should really not abandon it and and try to rectify that. Um, structure, the structure's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts of that? Mm. Well, I love the, in, the, in, the innovativeness of it, right? I love the idea of like, oh, okay. I love this feeling that like, hey, we really don't have to live here. I would take it a little further <laughs> as in leave the country. You know, I would, I would consider that. I'm not even half joking. I'm like, where can I go and like have decent health care when I'm, you know, five years from now? <laughs> Um, but um, I'd like his creativity. I'd like the sense that, look, we left things behind. We didn't just take all of these assets. We left things behind. Things had been taken from us that were forcibly left behind, and we also left things behind. We left a way of life behind for those right, that, 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 um, who were from the South. Um, I, but there's an assumption that a majority of black people will be in power because they're a majority. And that's a post-civil rights fiction, to my mind. You have lots, in fact, in the Mike Brown case, the use of municipal fines and fees, which I didn't get into here because I chose Trayvon, but if you get the book, you'll see what I mean. These use of municipal fines and fees are targeted for black communities partially because of pre-existing inequities, and they're black people running those towns. Hmm. Not all of them, but most. So if a system is set up to do what it's set up to do, you can put anybody in the front of it. Obama, the mayor of Atlanta, and, and I'm not blaming them. I'm saying you can't, just, black and brown faces in high places, as Cornell West would say, is not going to get us where we need to go. There could be amazing individuals, but even an individual activist or critical thinker isn't going to get us there. So I challenge that concept. I do think it's many ways more culturally comfortable. I mean, the truth of the matter is if you're going to be horrifically treated, you feel like there's a better chance that your humanity might be seen, although the cops do make this unlikely, um, in a black context, right? You should go to the black place and ask her to be file a complaint. I don't know, I guess you assume <laughs> they're gonna be nicer. So there's a kind of 
identity politics driving a political organizational framework, and I haven't seen that really work terribly well yet. That said, the South is a special and an important place that black people should claim and own. It does not exist without African enslaved people. The only last point about that, and then I think we have just we said time for one more, is that the black community in America is much more diverse than the African American South at this point. And we're a little behind in thinking through the consequences and complexity of that. About 15% of black people are not from the US at all. That's 15 now. It's only going to get bigger. Mm. And if you look at the enrollment in colleges and the absence of what I'd call domestic black people and the ways in which systemic racism affects them the most, because it's the longest, and it comes without that immigrant sort of construct, you know, that could get worse and worse, in which case they will just be erased or we will just be erased. So I'm not sure, right, that the South is going to save us from that, which is a different problem than, you know, gentrification in the North right now. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out because it's important to figure that out, and I, I don't have an answer, but thank you. That's a really, really good question. Mm. I appreciate that. Hi. Uh, do you think that the darkening of America as far as uh, immigrants and, uh, you know, the birth rates and mm -hmm. whatever, do you think that that could put a dent in, uh, into uh, racism or... Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. white supremacy or mm -hmm. patriarchy or whatever it is that's uh, keeping the system in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see America darkening to the point that it becomes a more of an issue? A more, yeah, a more, it becomes a more egalitarian thing because there just aren't enough. There's just, a, just the majority is of color and comfortable with that arrangement. Is that right, basically? No? Well, I'm not talking about a a majority right now, but like what I'm saying is like, uh, as you have the immigration, you know, mm -hmm. America just seems to be darkening. Yeah. And I see it, uh, a tenses, uh, a tenseness, and I see an electorate, like uh, you have whole states, like let's say Nevada, mm -hmm. Florida, which uh, happens to be Republican now, but it's a lot of Latinos down there. Right. A lot of them are brown. They're not, they're not like European white. Right. Like Cubans, say, for example. Right, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, so you you, you might yeah. have a lessening of that white European type population. Right, and uh, lower birth rate. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, you know possibly cutting down on the income inequality. You know, you got twenty dollar mm. per hour in uh, California. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe see a time where uh, people on one side can say, hey, you know, you know, this system is not working for the majority of us now, you mm -hmm. know, because America could easily be past that 50% yeah. if it's not there already. That's right, I see. Of black right. and brown people. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. It's super nuanced. I'm, I'm glad I got it wrong the first time so I could understand it better the second time. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, so. I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm going to say what I'm trying to do, and then I'm going to say why, why that, what you're saying is, is equally important but slightly different, so it'll maybe illuminate the problem for why it's not a straightforward answer for me. So I'm trying to show how this category of race that is used arbitrarily for people with brown skin, dark brown skin, um, to create conditions and circumstances that keep a, an inequality alive, that keep the working class, as a, in general, more quiet, um, and produces um, a, an investment in the illusion of this meritocracy, right? So that, those are the sort of basic goals of a lot of what I'm saying. And I'm saying, how do we fix that? But what you're illuminating here is like, well, how do we take this notion of what a white supremacist framework would be and separate it from white people, right? And say, when other people take it up, what happens? Do they, do they become equally invested? In this idea that it's a it's a land of opportunity, how will uh, they respond to that? In other words, where will we seek the evidence for how society has changed be, as it has a brownified or darkened itself? Is that is that a fairer, closer thing? Okay, so now here's here's where, where I get stuck. Whereas the first thing I get stuck on is okay, since 
racism and racial hierarchy is, a, is an ideology, it's a way of thinking, it's a paradigm, what makes brown and black immigrants feel invested in it? Because they do. You have many, many, many immigrants of color who frequently complain about African Americans being lazy. You might as well be in an all-white town sometimes. And they feel like, as an immigrant, they have the right. As a poor immigrant, I came from nothing, right? And I, my parents saved me and worked things up. And I'm not saying it didn't happen, but that's a different trajectory. That's this tiny little bubble of people who are popping out of massive poverty, right? You know, someone who comes from Brazil and makes it. I'm like, okay, well, do, should we talk about Brazil <laughs> a little bit? You know, I mean, that's like a whole different moment. So I think part of the, the problem for me is that we think white supremacy is white people. But white supremacy is an ideology. There are people of color, there are white people, there are all kinds, a whole rainbow of people who have an investment in it. That's why I said this whole banning of, of, of certain kind of books mm -hmm. and ways of thinking is about creating a kind of white person, mm -hmm. right? And it's also about making sure we do not create the other kinds of white people who might be more radical and engaged. Mm -hmm. It's not white people that's the problem, it's whiteness that's the problem, how, we, how it's been evaluated and valued and controlled and used to manipulate. So now we have to ask questions about why immigrants would want to invest, some of them, not all. Number one, because that's the American ideology. You know, if I'm going to a country, I know just what their main story is. If I want to try to live there, I got I to gotta play, by, play ball. I can't come in being a radical. But brown and really dark-skinned immigrants, people from the continent of Africa, um, dark-skinned Dominicans and Haitians who are not Puerto Ricans, right, who are not Cubans, they have a different experience over here. Because at some point, there's black, black, it doesn't matter where black is from, it's where you at. Now, once that happens, now you have new racializations forming. New groups of people who see themselves as black, because society's gonna keep constructing them that way, and new people who are sort of maybe creating what I call a kind of, you know, kind of like a colored population in the context of, say, South Africa. And that is something I can imagine, where colorism would advance as a category, all this talk about mixed race people are, you know, taking over the world. I mean, I'm like, please, it gives me a headache. Um, but this idea that we're breaking down barriers by creating another class of, <laughs> another race of people, right? So that's where I would go with that question. I don't have an answer, but I think the work has got to be ending this kind of racial hierarchy and eventually really ending the category of race. I agree with that, but not now. We, because we haven't done the homework and the emotional, psychological, political work to make that anything that would be helpful. Does that help a little bit answer your question? I was trying to give different angles to get at it because it's so, it's so interesting. Thank you very much for that, I appreciate it. The book is called Meta Racism: How Systemic Racism Devastates Black Lives and How We Break Free. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in appreciating Professor Teresha Rose for Thank a you. great conversation. Um, Thank you. And as I said, you've given us so much to think about. Read the book. Um, it's beautifully researched. Um, there is so, so much information in here and also a plan of action um, for people who are concerned about these things and uh, steps that, that all of us can take. So hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all for being with us. Please be safe getting home tonight. Great. Thank you so much for coming, and, and thanks for giving up a 75-degree evening <laughs> in, in April. <laughs> thanks again.